Right, watch this video to do October, November 22, paper 41. Every question well explained and how to avoid silly mistakes. Learn from me, I've made them all. Every silly mistake. Let's get going. Question 1A. Calculate the volume of a solid cylinder with a radius of 6 cm and a height of 14 cm. Now remember, first of all, volume is in cm cubed, so don't confuse that with a very long formula for the surface area. Okay, volume is more straightforward than that. All we need to do first is work out the area of the cross section of a cylinder, which in this case is a circle, with a radius of six centimeters so we do the pi r square formula that will give us the area of the circle and then to get the volume we multiply it by the length or the height in this case so that's what the formula is then the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared times h so the area of the circle we pi times six squared and then times the height 14. Okay, that's six square of okay, course gives us centimeter square. Tells about the height, another centimeter gives us centimeters cube. So let's put that into the calculator. And there we go. Hundred thousand five hundred and eighty-three. Okay, right, a good three six, etc. And then if you're gonna round it to three significant figures, cut it off there, it'll be 1580. Looking at the mask scheme, round it to three significant figures, or if you write the unrounded answer, you also get full marks. And there's the working out. Perfect. Right, solid hemisphere with a radius of six centimeter. And we're still doing volume. Okay, pay attention to the detail here, of course. Hemisphere means you half a sphere, and they give us a formula for a whole sphere. All right, meaning we're going to have to half that formula. So let's start by writing down the formula. So the volume is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. And again, like I said, pay attention to the detail is because it's a hemisphere half a ball we're not gonna have to half it so all we need to do next is put in the radius which is six and then half it here we go so fraction make sure you cube it Okay, that will give you the whole volume and then half it is the hemisphere. There we go, 452.389. Round it to three significant figures, which we cut it off there, it will be 452 centimeters cubed. Okay, there is all the unrounded answer. There they wrote a half instead of divide by two, same thing, and you've got it. Here we can see a cylinder and a hemisphere, nicely pictures, one on top of the other. Question B1 is simply changing the grams to kilograms. All right, and kilo meaning a thousand. That means to change it, we need to do 7.85 divided by a thousand. I mean, that's just moving the decimal point three spaces to the right. You can check it on your calculator, but that's all they want. They want to say 7.85 divided by a thousand, and then of course then the answer. So a mark for just writing that division. Okay, the total mass of the solid. Now remember, this is all still one question, and we did calculate the total volume of that whole shape. First, we calculated the cylinder, which is. 1580 and then the volume of this uh, hemisphere is 452 
So we add those two together, 32 centimeters cubed. That's the total volume of the solid. Okay, and then they tell us one centimeter cubed is 7.85 grams. So we just need to multiply that together. So each one centimeter cube is 7.85, and we got more than 2,000 of those cubes fitting inside the shape. So we can just multiply that together. And here we go 15951.2. Okay, um, I'm not going to round this to three significant figures because it's kind of an exact answer and then we see I've got it wrong. Okay, of course because they want it in kilograms and this would have been grams. Yeah, so be sharp, don't make silly mistakes. We need to divide that by a thousand. Let's just make this clear. So this will be wrong. We'll lose a mark there. Okay. We want to divide that by a thousand. So it'll be 15.9512 kilograms is the correct answer. Or of course, if you use this from the beginning and multiply that, then we get the answer straight away. So you just remember your details are important. So anything, well, round it to 16, get your marks, or the unrounded like I've written it, also is still correct. Okay, so if you're asleep early in the morning like I am at the moment, wake up, pay attention to detail, units are important. All right, easy marks to get and easy marks to lose. Right, question C, we need to break it down a little bit, right? So they're 2,000 centimeters cubed of iron, they melt it down and they make 50 spheres with a radius of 2 centimeters. And I think we're going to have to start there by using this formula here. So the volume of a sphere. So let's see what is the total volume of those 50 spheres. So let's first work out the volume of one sphere. So volume of one sphere is calculated by using this formula, of course. And then we're going to make 50 of them. So we times that by 50. Let's see what we get. So let's do that. Let's start off with that. So here we go. 4 over 3. Uh, 50 of them Just times up by 50 and there we go one six seven five point don't round this answer yet because it's not a final answer so one six seven five point how many digits to write I get like four or five is enough okay just don't run into three significant figures yet because we want the most accurate answer uh, so what how much iron is left? So making 50 spheres takes that amount of iron. So we started off with 2,000. To see how much is left, we need to subtract it, of course. Okay, so on your calculator, we can uh, type in 2,000. Minus, we put answer, put the previous answer in there, which is still 100% correct, and we get... How much iron is left? 324.48. Once again, this is not the rounded answer. Okay, because what they want now is a percentage. Okay, percentage is like when you do an exam, you take what you have, right? So the percentage of iron that is left, first of all, the exact amount of iron that is left is this. Out of the original amount you had. And of course, times that by 100 that's how you calculate percentage so we still have that there we can now divide it by 2000 okay that gives us a decimal value times 100 and it gives a very accurate 
because I haven't rounded anything on my calculator. Percentage, 16.224, etc. Now we can round it to three significant figures, 16.2%. Okay, there we go, 16.2. All the unrounded answer is also good. And they show here what I've done just in one big calculation, but I've broken it down into smaller pieces. So it's a bit more clear. Okay. Right, then they take the item that is left over. So what was that? What was the left? 324.48. Let's use that. 324.48. That is the centimeters cubed item that is left over. And they make it into a cube. What's a cube? Cube has got all the sides the same length. Length width and height, three dimensions, yeah? Cube, beautiful cube that, perfectly drawn. Yeah, so we got that, let's say the width, the length and the height, so it's three measurements. And if you multiply these three measurements together, you get the volume of the cube. Now we just need to do the opposite of melting three, melt, multiplying three things together, which of course will be the cube root. So let's work out the cube root of that. Okay, my answer is still pretty accurate. Five significant figures, so I'm just going to use that. Five significant figures. Three, two, four point four eight equals six point eight seven one six. Rounded to three significant figures. Six point eight seven. The length of the cube, 6.87, spot on, so slacker enough, but they give you some leniency, leniency there. Okay, and FT meaning follow through, so if you had the previous answer wrong, would you use that to cube root it? You get your mark. Okay, these questions where they just ask stuff about 3D figures, and they don't give you any pictures. No picture ever anywhere. Yeah, no, they can be confusing. There's always a good idea to draw yourself a little sketch. Let's do that. Take your pencil out. Let me say. All right, a solid cone. What does a cone look like again? Yeah. There we go. Party hat. All right, solid cone. It's a radius of three r. The moment you see, they don't give you numbers. They give you some other stuff. Then you know you're gonna have to think carefully. Slant height of 9R. Now, slant height is that slanted side, of course, 9R. And now we've got a cylinder as well. Okay, let's draw the cylinder then. Solid cylinder. My drawing is just brilliant today. Height is 7x and a radius of x. The total surface area of the cone is equal to the total surface area of the cylinder. Given that r equals kx, find the value of k. Oh my goodness, where to start with this? Well, let's start with what they've given us. They've given us the Curved surface area, again, detail, people, detail. Curved surface area of a cone, right? Given us a curved. Do not do this stuff in bold. I always do that. Okay, so be sharp. So let's just start with the given us. The area, curved surface area of a cone with pi r l and our cone the radius is 3r so this is pi times 3r times l where l is slant height times 9r okay so to simplify all of that 3 times 9 being 27 r times r being r squared 
and we can let the pi hang around like just an, another letter that's the curved surface area but we need to find the total surface area so yeah the curved surface area was only it's only this part now we need to add the surface area of the bottom which of course is just plain circle so that would of course be the area of a circle pi r squared and in this case the radius being 3r so it's pi times 3r squared now what is 3r squared well 3 squared is 9 and r squared is r squared so r times r squared now 3r times 3r is 9r squared and we have the pi hanging around okay meaning the total surface area is we run out of space here let's do it here so the total area of the cone will be 27 r squared pi plus the circle at the bottom r squared pi now because we got r squared pi and r squared pi they are like terms we can add them together and that will give us a beautiful square number 36 r squared pi or pi r squared you could put the pi in front of the r either way i think it's all right so that's the total surface area of the cone excellent we're making progress i'm sure we've picked up a few marks already the total surface of the cone is equal to the total, total surface area of the cylinder. So let's work out the total surface area of the cylinder. Let's get a bit of a change of color. <coughs> so the surface area of a cylinder, of course, is a bit of a formula. It is the area of a circle, pi r squared, times 2 because a cylinder has two circles, one at the top, one at the bottom, plus, and now the middle part, of course, of a cylinder, if you remember the net of a cylinder is a rectangle with two circles, that length of that rectangle is, of course, the circumference of the circle, so that will be 2 pi r, which is the circumference of a circle, but also the length of that one, times the height. So that's h do you remember that formula if you don't remember it's just two circles and a rectangle with a rectangle length it is a circumference of the circle all right so in our case what do we have we got two pi the radius being x so we can simply substitute that for x squared and then plus two pi and again the radius is x, which is 2 pi x, and the height is 7x. Okay, now we can multiply the x and the 7x together. That gives us 2 pi, well, and the, the 2. We can multiply the 2 times, it's like this, 2, forget about the pi, 2 times x times 7x. That's what we're basically doing. What would that be? 2 times 7 is 14. x times x is x squared. And then we can throw the pi back in at the back. All right? So that's how we can simplify this. Let's just get it right. So that will be 2 times 7 is 14. There's the pi. And x times x is x squared. Put the pi in front of the x squared over here. It doesn't matter. And of course, here we had x squared as well. Now, again, just like before, it is like terms pi x squared pi x squared that will give us 16 pi x squared not x to the power x squared okay progress is being made so that is the surface area of the cylinder in terms of x okay so they are equal these two are equal, so now we can put them equal to each other. Let's jump to a new color. So that means 36 r squared pi is equal to 16 
Well, I put the pi at the end. It keeps the pi at the end. Like I said, you could have 16 pi x squared or 16 pi x squared. 16 x squared pi. I put the pi at the end. Put the, uh, who cares? Right, so what do we want? What do we, Given that r equals kx, so if we can get rid of stuff, then it would be beautiful. And we can. We can. We can. We can. Look there. We want the r alone. So let's do that. Let's, I'm going to start by uh, leaving the r squared, leaving 6x by, and what I'm going to do is to divide both sides by pi, or divide the pi on the other side, either way you understand this, and divide both sides by 36, or divide 36 on the other side. So I basically move that, yeah? So that means divide pi by pi, that cancels out. And then we got 16 over 36x squared. So we can leave it like that. We can simplify it. We don't have to. I'm not simplifying because my next step would be to get rid of that square. And of course, how do you get rid of the square? You square root. Square root both sides. Or you square root the other side. And this just works out beautifully. Let me just make that three a beautiful three. Okay, because everything there can now be square rooted. Okay, so that means square root of 16 is 4, square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 36 is 6. I mean, we could have simplified beforehand, we'll divide both by 2, by 4, yeah, divide 4 by 4, you get you get you get 4 over 9 you square root 4 over 9 you get the same simplified answer here 4 over 6 simplified is same as 2 over 3 and x you can keep the x at the top and put it at the back either way now look what we have r equals kx so we got r equals 2 thirds x so k is that thing in front of the x 2 thirds or 0. Point six recurring two-thirds or equivalent means yeah and that's it we've done it okay let's break things down slowly carefully and you can get your marks here brilliant all right after that highlight we break down to something a little bit more straightforward easier okay uh Correct to the nearest 10. Where's the 10 there? So we need to cut this off there. Don't let the 0.99 confuse you. We always just look at the number that's next to the digit we're rounding. And that's a 4. So it means that 9 stays a 9. But we need to add a 0 because it's not 299. It's 2,990. Okay. Very common people to try and round up everything. Because they round the 9 the 4 to a 5 because not and then it's, it's wrong it's wrong okay so it's 2990 correct answer only nothing else all right one decimal place now this time we just look at the 8 so we need to round the 9 up after 9 comes 10 but there's a 0 so the answer is 1 do you have to put point zero? yeah it looks like you have to to show that it's one decimal place. It didn't put that zero in brackets. So I would say that point zero in this case seems to be important. You put it there because it shows you've rounded it to one decimal place, even though it's the same as one. Okay. If in the mark scheme that zero was in brackets, like this, I would say the zero was optional, but it's not. So it's not optional. Have it there, point zero. Two significant figures. Now remember, a zero doesn't count if it's at the beginning of the number or at the end. But if, if it's between the other two digits, it does count as a significant figure. So the two will be the first significant figure. The zero will be the second significant figure. And because there's a nine next to it, we need to round up the zero to a one. Okay, but of course you need to put another two zeros because... We can't round 2090 to 21. We need to round it to 2100. Okay. So there we go. That's that one.
correct answer only again all right prime number between 90 and 100 okay number that can only be divided by one in itself what could that be okay 91 is my guess what can you divide 91 can I, and it won't be an even number because they all can be divided by two it won't be 93 because you can divide it by three you can divide 90 by three and three by three it won't be 95 you divide it by five could be 97 it won't be 99 so 91 is my guess and you can always do trial and error 97 probably as well and i was wrong you see i was wrong uh, early in the morning what should you have done what should you have done is you should have taken 91 and said fine can i divide it by four five six five by seven yes i can divide it by seven you didn't check you need to check okay so 91 wrong 97 is the only one to the power of minus six as a fraction remember the rules of indices okay rules of indices meaning if you've got a number to a negative power you can write it as a denominator like this so that means two to the power of minus six we can write as one two over six now do we have to calculate it I'm sure it won't do any harm. 2 to the power of 6, 64. Okay, more thorough answer. Okay, if you're not sure, write both. I mean, they are the same thing. 1 over 64, yeah, final answer. So I will definitely get my mark there. I wrote everything. Standard form. Remember, standard form, we have a number that is from 1 to 9. So that means we need to move the decimal point 1 to 3 spaces to behind the 7 so it becomes 7.01 times 10 and because it's a small number it will be negative 3 okay remember you can always change your calculator to standard form you press uh, shift setup and then you want it in psi scientific notation you usually want three significant figures but just put four just in case then you can put any number in there zero zero seven zero one and bam no oh, there we go standard form okay that extra zero is there because i pressed the four so it's four significant figures okay so there you are stuff in standard form okay <coughs> you can always switch it back by pressing shift set up you want normal so you press eight one or two, I think two is better for various reasons, and then you get the answer back to normal. Okay, so what's the next question here? Simplify. Okay, I think what they want you to notice here is that minus one there, which means those like those one point fives won't line up. Okay, usually if you add stuff, call a method, you line them up. So let's for example say, for example, it's not it, but let's say x equals 2. Okay, that means 1.5 times x to the power of 2 would be 1.5 times 100, which is 150, no? yeah that's it but that means 1.5 times 10 x minus 1 is 1.5 times 10 to the power of 1 which is just 10 which is 15 which means if you add them up now you do 150 plus 15 you get 1 6 5 yeah so they don't line up now x could be anything it could be three four five a thousand a million we don't know what it is but the same thing would happen that the second number um shifts but to the right so the lining up of the numbers would be the same we'll end up with the same digits one six five right 
Now, if we want to draw 165 in standard form, we're going to have to move the decimal point two spaces to the left. So that will give us 1.65 times 10 squared because I moved the two spaces. Okay, but just remember now, we don't know what x is. So instead of the 2, I'm going to write the x. I hope that makes sense. That is correct. Question F. Write as a fraction. You will show you're working. Okay, so this is where you, they want you to do this whole thing where you say x equals 0 0.37 recurring. Okay. And then... Well, there's two things. We can multiply by 10 or multiply by 100. Let's multiply by 10 because there's one number recurring. So we multiply both sides by 10. That means 10x will equals 3.7 recurring. What we do now is we subtract the first equation from the second one. So I'm going to write the second equation around down again. Okay. And we subtract them. 10x minus 1x is 9x. Uh, we do this because now you can imagine there's a bunch of 7s, infinite amount of 7s there. But if we subtract them, we subtract the infinite amount of 7s from each other and they will cancel out. Okay. Uh, the 3 minus the 0 will stay a 3. This 7 minus this 3 would be a 4. And the infinite amount of remaining 7s minus the infinite amount of remaining 7s will be 0. And that is just awesome. So that means what? X equals 3.4. We divide both sides by 9. Divide 9 aside. And we have a fraction there. It's just one problem. There's a decimal point. All right. We don't mix decimal points and fractions. But there's a quick solution. If we times the top by 10, there's no more decimal point and equivalent fraction states that so we can do that as long as we do the same at the top and the bottom and then we have our answer all right you could have also multiplied the first equation by 100 and then you wouldn't have had this decimal point problem but it doesn't matter we solved it always just double check 34 divided by 9 right, let's write it let's write it as a fraction like it is 34 over 90 gives us 0 0.37 recurring exactly what we want and we showed everything let's see uh, so they don't really need the x thing but they want to see that subtraction there or equivalence yeah so they multiplied it by a hundred to get 34 uh, I'm one with 10 so the lucky the or equivalent is there so I'm sure I'll get my marks okay but if you want to be safe and multiply both by a hundred you end up with 34 and 90 on the left same thing, same thing. You get the right answer. You show you're working. Get okay, full marks. Right, inequality shown by the number line. It means there's a number in the middle there somewhere. Let's call it X. So there's an X, one of these numbers in the middle. Okay. It is to the right of minus 2. So it's bigger than minus 2, but not minus 2 because there's a hole. It doesn't include minus 2. And it's to the left of 4, so it's smaller. But it can be 4 because it's shaded, it's colored in. Okay, so x is minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Okay, but there we go, those signs are important. Okay, solve the inequality next. So the first thing we would do is get rid of the plus 3. So that means you subtract 3 everywhere. So it would look something like this. So we got 2x, and then I subtract the 3 on the left, and I subtract the 3 from the minus 3 on the left, on the right, so I said left before, I mean subtract 3 on the right, subtract 3 on the left, that gives us minus 6, 2x and 6. Next thing would be to, to divide that 2, to divide everything by 2, so it's minus 6 divided by 2, and divide 6 by 2. Final answer, minus 3. Keep the signs the same. 3. Yes, there we go.
Okay, very complicated here what they're showing, but that's basically what we did. Okay. All the integers, remember integers meaning whole numbers, no fractions involved, because that would be infinite number of answers. Let's satisfy this inequality. So that means x can be minus 3, because you got the more than or equal sign, means it can be minus 2, anything bigger. All right, all the way up to 2, but not 3, because it's the less than sign and not equal. So starting from minus 3 to final answer. Okay. Then we get to solving some equations. Oh my goodness, they don't make this easy, do they? Tell you what, question one, I'll do it two ways. First way I'm going to try is... Um, I'm just going to move the 3, bracket 3 minus x to the other side. Just keep it like that, right? So 2, 2 bracket, x plus 2, over 5. Move that to the other side, this, so the 1 is there, don't forget it, minus 3, bracket 3, minus x, close bracket. Okay, uh, let's expand those brackets there, so minus 3 times 3 is minus 9, minus 3 times minus x, be careful here, will be plus. 3x. Okay, don't forget we still have this whole thing on the other side. Okay. Now 1 minus 9, of course, is minus 8. And there's a 3x. So let's let's do that. That's 3x minus 8. I just swapped it around. It looks prettier. Okay, next we're gonna really get rid of this 5. We're gonna multiply it there. Now we got a choice. You see there's a minus in front. We can leave it there or we can multiply it with that 5. Let's leave it there for now. Okay, so 5 goes there. We're multiplying it there. The minus, don't lose it. I'm going to leave it there for now. Now let's expand all the brackets. 5 times 3x is 15x. 5 times minus 8 is minus 40. Minus 2 times x is minus 2x. Minus 2 times plus 2 being minus 4. Huh. Leave the minus 4 where it is, add 40, both sides are there, leave the 15x where it is, add 2x, minus 4 plus 40, 40 is 36, 15 plus 2x is 17x, so what I get for my final answer is 36 over 17. Bit of a weird answer, isn't it? Let's see if I'm right. Yes, we're right. Have confidence in yourself, mate. It feels awkward. Okay. Nice. I said there will be another way to do it. Let's do it another way. Let's do this in green. Okay. You might be tempted to, to do this as uh, you would do fractions. So meaning, imagine that is over 1. Which means you need to get the denominators the same. All right, so we basically have two fractions. Let me write that again. So you've got 3, 3 minus x over 1 minus 2, x plus 2 over 5 equals 1. Okay, so we're now subtracting two fractions. Remember, if you like, for example, let's go on a little tangent quickly. Uh, if you are um, subtracting from a half a third, one way to do this is get the denominators the same, so 2 times 3 is 6, multiply the 3 there, and multiply the 2, so 3 minus 2, you get the answer, 1, 6. We're going to do the same here, okay, according to the smiley face method, you multiply the 2, the denominators the same, so we get, it will be 5, that's all turned to gray. Then you multiply the 5 there. So you're going to multiply the 5 with all of this. You're going to multiply the 5 with the 3 first. So that will be 15, which will then multiply with what's in the bracket. And then you multiply the 1 there, which is very easy. 
goes to state anything times one stays the same. Just don't forget that minus in the middle. So one times two is two, x plus two equals one. Maybe this method is a little bit easier, right? Now we can take that five, that's the bottom, multiply it on the other side. So that will be five times one is five. And we can expand the brackets at the top, 15 times three being 45, 15 times minus x is minus 15x, minus two times x is minus two x, minus two times plus two being minus four. Uh, minus 15x, minus two x, minus 17 x, 45 minus four being uh, 41. So we get minus 17x, move that to the other side, 5 plus 41 being 46. Uh, I don't like what's happened here, what's happened here? Of course that's positive, 45 minus 4 is plus 41. Oh, goodness, see, one little sign. So that means it will be 5 minus 41, excellent. That will give us minus 17x equals a negative 36. So final step here, x equals negative 36 divided by negative 17. Two negative cancels out, we get the same answer. Whichever one works for you, just be careful with those negatives. Yeah, it goes so much wrong. With one sign wrong and the whole thing flops. And you get answer 36 over 17. Doesn't feel right, but it's correct. It's correct. Okay, whichever way works for you best, right? I'm not saying the one is better than the other. It's the one you understand and practice will work. Okay, well, this question, it's the same thing. We do this. Oh, no, wait. No, 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 no. Okay. I'm going to get rid of the fractions by multiplying x plus 5 on the other side. So basically, it's going to the top. So the 5 stays there, we're going to multiply it by x plus 5. 3 stays here, we multiply that over there, so that becomes x plus 3. Expand the brackets, 5 times x is 5x, 5, 5 times 5 is 25. 3 times x is 3x, 3 times 3 is 9. Right, we're going to leave the 5x there and subtract the 3x from it. Well, we leave the 9 there and subtract the 25 from it. Again, I'll swap these around, yeah? The 9 is positive, the 25 negative. That will give us 2x. 9 minus 25 will give us negative 16. Negative 16. Which, if we divide it by 2, is negative 8. Now, if you don't have this beautiful mark scheme with you, you, just check your answers, you're on the exam, and you really want to know if you got it right, you can always substitute this back in there. Okay, and you don't have to write it down even, just do it quickly, right? So we got 5 over x is minus 8 plus 3. That's minus 1. So when I do the other side, which is 3 at the top and a... Uh, 5 at the bottom, I should also get minus 1, and we know it's right. Could have done the same at the top, by the way. It takes a bit longer, but if you go 3, bracket, 3 minus, what do we answer? 36 over 17. If you're sitting in the exam, you've got some time, you don't know if it's right, you want to check. <coughs> do this. Okay. 36 over 17 is the answer we got plus 2 bracket over 5 now if we get the answer 1 we know we're right damn close damn close but not 83 over 85 why oh there we go you see I put 37 one of those days no you got it right you can check it if you think your answer is a bit funny. Question four. Talking about Zach investing money at simple interest. So remember the formula for simple interest. The interest, this is important, the I, the N's, is the 
principal, the money starts with, times the rate, times the time, divided by 100. That's the formula. Right, so you invest 500, that's the principal, the 500, the money you invest at the beginning. The rate is 2%, and it does it for 5 years, divide that by 100, and we will get the interest. So let's do that. Uh, 500 times 2 times 5 divided by 100. 50. How do we know it's only the interest? Because it's a lot less money than you put in, right? Don't put 500 in, you end with 50. Put 500 in and you get 50 extra. Be very careful here. It says calculate the value of Zach's investment. We only worked out the interest. The value of his investment is how much money he has in the bank now. So that's the principal, the original amount he put in, plus the interest the bank gives him. So the value of his investment is now 550. So we have to add that together, not from wrong working. Okay. Now the next one is compound interest. Remember the formula for compound interest. It's the amount, which is the total amount which is the value of the investment, which is different from the formula from simple interest, which only give us the interest, the I. So that I and that A, they are important. They mean different things. Okay, is the principal amount 1 plus the rate over 100 time. So substituting values in there, the principal is 500. 1 plus, and now... The interest rate is only 1.8, not 2. And it's 5 years, so let's put that in. Uh, 500, 1 plus 1.8 over 100, bracket, bracket to the power of 5, 5, 4, 6. Point six four nine. Okay, and it's money, so it's always wise to round it to two decimal places. So that's five four six point six five. Check now, yeah. Compound interest formula gives you the value of the investment, not just the interest. Whereas with simple interest, it only gives you the uh, interest, only the extra money the bank pays you. Compound just gives you the total value of the whole investment. Okay. So, I mean, the interest here is $46.65, but they asked for the total value. Okay. So, she made a little bit less money because the, the interest rate was 0.2% less. Okay. But being compound interest, it would eventually surpass um, <clears throat> Zach's simple interest investment. And they want to know how many more complete years in bold before we surpass. Okay, three marks. Three marks. So, what's going to happen? Well, we can start with Zach over there. Zach. Let's say Zach, yeah. Because he's got simple interest. Okay they are just gonna keep adding on the same amount each year that is two percent of 500 what is two percent of 500 we know after five years you got 550 but they are adding two percent so 0 0.02 times 500 every year they add on 10 more so after six years he's gonna have 560 after seven years, 570. After eight years, 580. After nine years, 590. After 10 years, 600. Okay. But Yasmin over there. Man, I'm sure we can work out some complicated formula to do this. I'm just going to do trial and error. So we know that her amount in the bank is the original. 1 plus, it always gets 1.8, but it's, okay, and then the time. 
Okay, so let's do that to the power of six. So we can put that in and see what happens after. One more here. So to the power of six. So after six years, he's got 556.489, and Zach over there has still got 560, so he's still a bit better. So we can now do trial and error. Let's jump to 10 years and see if it's more than 600. No, it's not. Okay, uh, let's make a bigger jump. It seems to go up quite slowly. So after 15 years, Zach will have another $50. Let's check what Jasmine have after 15 by simply changing that to 15. Yep, we went past. All right, so it's definitely less than 15. Definitely less than 15. Let's put in some more values here. Okay, so it's 11, 12, 13, 14 years. So that would be 610. 620, 630, 640. Okay, let's work backwards. Let's see what 14 years. 641. Yep, that is more. That is more than 640. So after 13 years. Yep, just about 51 cents. Let's check 12 years. No. 619 is less than 620, so there we go. The answer is 30. Just show that you know this, okay? By slotting in 501 plus 1.8 over 100. And what we say, 13, right? 13 was the magic number to show that 630.51. All right, so that would be 13 years. And I did that by trial and error. Let's see what the mask scheme says. Uh, mm, it says eight. Well, I get two marks to find the answer of 13. Why is mine wrong? Because you don't read what is in bold. It's there. How many more complete years? Okay more complete years so that means after the five years how many more this from five to eight that's eight years okay so that's why on the line we've got two marks but on the line i should have written eight years because it's eight more 13 years in total since the original investment but eight more after five years you see small little details you need to pay attention to which is very important okay and if you're half asleep like you didn't get enough sleep maybe the night before your exam you make silly mistakes like i've been making today this is my third one not good is it so be sharp on the day of your exam sleep enough question b uh, javier buys a car it decreases exponentially all right, this is the same as compound interest, except for one small difference, okay? You take the principal amount, the amount, it was the value of the car in this case at the beginning. You do one, and now this is the only difference. Instead of adding, you're subtracting. Then it's the rate over 100 and the time, okay? So it's the same formula. It's compound interest, exponential decreation, dec decrease of exponentially, whatever. Uh, but with a minus, so it's 2500 zero, zero, 1 minus the rate being 10% in this case. Five years again. So let's do that. Five years. 1476.2. Three rounded to the two decimal places. Okay, does it make sense? Possible five years, 10% decrease. Do we want the amount? Or just for how much decrease? We want the amount. So that is it. 
Okay. One, four, seven, six. Correct answer only. Again, 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 man. You see? This is asleep. Then if you sleep enough, you make silly mistakes. Read the question. Give your answer correct to the nearest dollar. You see how easy it is to lose these marks? You should write one, four, seven, six, or you lose a mark. So I again would have got only two out of three. Read. Pay attention to these. Read, 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 read every little detail in the question okay see correct answer only so if you don't go one four seven six on that line you're not getting full marks i would have gotten two okay right next one the number of a certain type of bacteria increases exponentially at a rate of r percent each day after 22 days the number of the sphere has doubled find the value of r okay so let's say there is an x amount of bacteria okay at the beginning so the principle is x so we're going to use the same formula for uh, compound interest okay because it's increasing so that would be the amount of bacteria there is is the amount there is the beginning because one plus the rate over 100 and the time okay what do we have right we set the principle is x so the amount after 22 days will be 2x the amount there is r is the thing we don't know but t is the amount of time the amount of day so that will be 22 all right how can we solve this let's see what we can do let's see what we can do let's get rid of that x so we divide the x on the other side so 2x divided by x we're left with 1 r 122 so to cancel the x's we get 2 now we need to get rid of the 22 what's the opposite of power 22 of course root 22 oh this is going to be crazy and we have the one plus r over 100 let's see if this works sounds a little bit crazy so we need to put root 22 so you press that shift you press shift and that button there we can put any root of 2 Oh, that's nice 1.032 I think if you look at that carefully you're getting on to something next thing I would subtract the one subtract the one and we're left with R over 100 so subtract one from that that gives us 0 0.032 Last step, multiply the 100. And the answer being 3.2. Actually, a lot easier than we thought, eh? 3.2, 0, 0, 0, doesn't matter, 3.2 is there. Yeah, two marks was root 22. Beautiful. All right, so just by putting these X's out there, got the answer. See how easy it is actually. 100 students is eating pizza. So, five minutes, just about five minutes is what the fast eaters ate the whole pizza. That's silly, man. Five minutes. And then the longest it took them was 15 minutes. Still, man, you just want to enjoy your pizza. It was one pizza slice, maybe. <sighs> Let me put this in an exam and make you hungry. All right, find an estimate of the median. Median meaning middle. So if you line them up from the fastest student eats the fastest, the one that ate the pizza in five minutes, just over five minutes, to the last one, who just took 15 minutes, how long would it have taken the middle one? All right, and that's what we do, the cumulative frequency. Halfway through the 100 and zero is, of course, 50. The median would be there at 50. 
Okay, so take your ruler and your pencil. Yeah. And you draw a line. Draw the line. Because that way the examiner sees that you, you're serious about stuff. You know what you're doing. Okay. There we go. We go down. Wobbly I am. Alright, carefully look at the scale. Each big one is uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, nine. And then there's five squares in between, so 9.2, 9.4, 9.6. Now we said 9.4, 9.4, I would say it is. 9.4 minutes. Still a bit fast, man. We want to eat pizza that fast. 9.4. Okay, be correct. Interquartile range. Right, that means we need to get the lower quartile. So for the lower quartile, we take the bottom half, half of 50 being 25, so be careful, this will be 30, so 25 will be there in the middle. Okay, so again, ruler. So this is between those two squares. Kind of. Going down. Okay, what is that? Eight. So the lower quartile is eight. Then we need to get the upper quartile. So it is halfway between 15 and 100, which would be 75. So there's 70, 75 will be there. So here we go. Between those two lines, go down. Was that 10.4, right? 10.4. So the upper quartile, that would be 10.4. So the interquartile range is when you subtract the lower quartile from the upper quartile, or rather the distance between these two values. That is the interquartile range. Okay. 10.4 minus 8 being 2.4. Bang on. Excellent. Okay. Be accurate. You see, you can't be one square off here, yeah? Be accurate. Right. Number of students taking more than 11 minutes to eat the pizza. So here we'll go to 11 minutes. 11 minutes is there. And we now need to find the number of students. So again, we're going to draw some lines. This way, we're going the other way. Draw a line going up to the graph. And going sideways. There we go. So, what is that? So, again, we got five squares between 80 and 90. So, each square must be two. So I would say that's 82 students um, taking, well, the 82nd student takes 11 minutes. The number is taking more than 11 minutes. So it's the top half from 82 to 100 that is, we have to look at because it's more than 11 minutes. Okay, so it's this stretch here and that will be 18. 18 students bang be careful it's not 17 you're tempted to go like well if the 80 second student 11 minutes is only the ones above but no just take it don't overthink it okay 18 students it is right so they're burning off the pizza by throwing tennis balls table shows the result Four of them throw a ball between 0 and 20 meters, and then there's 15 that throw it between 45 and 60 meters. Calculate an estimate of the mean. Now remember, mean is where you add up everything. So we need to add up all the distances of each throw of the ball. Okay, problem is we don't know exactly how far they threw the ball. We only know the first four students threw somewhere between 0 and 20 meters. 
assuming one could have just dropped it on the floor another one could have lobbed it about 10 meters we don't know so we need to take an average so we take the midpoint there we say right we're going to assume on average they threw it 10 meters because that's the midpoint between 0 and 20 and four of them threw it so that will be a total of roughly estimate 40 meters that's why we're giving an estimate because we don't know exactly we're just guessing okay so those four students we say together adding all the lengths about 160 meters that they threw the ball so we just continue doing that so next 38 students threw it somewhere between 20 and 30 so we say on average they would have thrown 25 meters we get all those distances together next one halfway is 32.5 half between 30 and 35 is 32 and a half so 40 students throwing at 32 and a half then we got 53 students throwing the 35 and 45 so that's 40 and the last one we got 15 students now if you're not sure what is halfway between two points you can always just do this you to add them together 45 plus 60 and divided by 2 okay then you get the exact midpoint if you're not sure okay if you want to be safe add them together divided by 2 so halfway between 45 and 60 is 52.5 okay get it right you don't want to lose a mark and that so we add up all those distances we get all the distances together that's the total distance all the throws all together that's what you do in the mean you add up everything divided by how many there is in this case how many students were there and uh, they told us 150 students or we add up the frequency right this is most of the hard work done most of the marks changed. just be very careful when you put it in okay it's easy to make mistakes final answer 29.536 occurring 29. think is it possible where is 29 there I would have been liked more like in the 30s more to the middle yeah so if your answer doesn't make sense you see that mine is wrong and you need to go back 29 is just too low the middle is more to the right so you know this is probably wrong it's probably wrong okay you go back you check your calculations where could I have made a mistake and you see right there okay just spot already uh, spot already I typed a plus instead of a times okay so do think does my answer make sense is it roughly in the middle seems a bit off double check it and then you get a new answer and that one 35.54 if you just draw a line through this because it's so easy to make a mistake 35.54 is around about here is that roughly in the middle yeah that seems like a more sensible answer still my answer is wrong okay at least I would have gotten uh, I would have gotten three out of four marks okay so let's double check where could I have made a mistake um, there we go I put 4 times 40 instead of 4 times 10 now we got it right 34 0.65 you see how easy it is to make a mistake so easy double check your answer check if it makes sense okay it should be somewhere in the middle double check it be confident though if you show you're working out okay like you show that you use the midpoints you show that you add them together 
show the divide by 150, you'll get three out of four marks. And then if you just have a typo like I did, uh, two, then you still get most of the marks. But today just is not my day. I make lots of mistakes. On to question oh no. five. B part two. Mm, there we go. Right, histogram. The moment you see histogram, remember this formula which we can put in the form of a triangle. Okay. And that is that the frequency, you see that is the frequency. I abbreviated FR equals the class width. This is going to be the class width, how wide these classes is. All right, for example, this one is 20, this one is 10, this one is 5, this one is 10, and this one is 15. You know how wide it is? Times the frequency density. Okay. Now, on a histogram, if you draw one, the class width would be down here. Okay, which in this case will be distance in meters. So the class width is how wide the bars are. And the frequency density will be on the side here. Okay. And the frequency then would be the area of a bar. So well, we multiply the, the, the class width by the frequency density. So let's see, for the one class where we actually have information about everything is the middle one here, all right? Now the height of the bar, of course, yeah, that will be the frequency density. The frequency density, yeah, so, so. let's work out uh, the frequency density for this class that we got information with the class width is 5 let's make the 5 look like a 5 the frequency is 40 so if we do uh, 40 divided by 5 that's now the frequency divided by the class width we get 8 but that's not what they give us for the height of the bar, which is the frequency density, that is 12. So, what have they done? Well, they take the frequency density and they have multiplied it by something. What is that something? 12 divided by 8, I think you will see that is 1.5. So, to get the actual height of the bar, you need to take the frequency density and multiply it by 1.5. That's what I think it is. That's all it is. So meaning for the first one, we need to take the frequency, okay, frequency divided by the class width. So that will be 4 divided by 20, which of course give us 0 0.25. Let's put that on 4 divided by 20. And then we need to do the same, 0 0.5. 0 0.2, sorry, 0.2. And then we need to do the same, we need to multiply that by 1.5. And then we get the height of the bar, which is 0 0.3 centimeters. And we need to keep doing that. We take the frequency, 38, divided by 10, so that's 3.8. All right, and 3.8 times 1.5, bam, 5.7. Next one will be, of course, 53 divided by 10, 5.3, 5.3 times 1.5 times bigger, 7.95. Last one, 15 divided by 15 is 1. 1 times 1.5 is 1.5. 
0 0.3, 5 0.7, 7.95, 1.5. So it's difficult again, I ask you a histogram question without an actual histogram. But this is what it boils down to. Just write down the formula and work from there. Two students are chosen at random. Find the probability that they both threw the ball more than 45 meters. Okay, so how many students threw the ball more than 45 meters? Let's see, here we go, it's the last class. So we're gonna have to pick the students from there. So, chance of picking a student out of 150, remember? Where was it, 150 up there? Um, there are 15 of them that threw more than 45 meters, so that will be 15 out of 850. That's picking the first student, probably picking the first student. Then we pick another student, and the logic describes that we're not going to pick the same student twice. So that means there will only be 14 students left that threw the ball more than a 800, uh, more than 45 meters, and there will be only 149 students left to choose from. The last question is what do we do with these values? Do we add them or multiply them? Remember, if the OR rule states that we add, and the AND rule states that we multiply. So, do we pick one student or the other student, or do we pick one student and the other student? So we have to pick the one and the other. Right, so we multiply it. Okay, so we put that into our calculator. And we get the answer 7 over 7, 4, 5. Yep, that's what they want. Or equivalent, meaning you're writing as a decimal. And the working out is there exactly like I showed you. Excellent. Column vectors, column vectors, column vectors. First one, straight up, we got a vector of minus 1, 1 basically means you go from a point you move uh, one to the left and one up yeah that's the vector going like this put a three in front that means that vector goes three times more than that so you just multiply the top with the top that's minus three the bottom with the bottom that's three that's all that's all to it next one the vector p is two three don't put that line there, it's not a fraction, okay? We subtract from that the vector minus one, one. Basic subtraction here, okay? What it means is, yeah, you've got a vector, remember, two, two at the top means you've got two to the right, and then you got three up. So the vector looks like this. Then you subtract from that a vector where you go one to the left and one up. So that vector looks like this. And the end they want to know what is this vector going from there to there. Okay, meaning two minus minus one is the same as two plus one, that's three. Three minus one is the same as two. So vector we go three up and two up. That's all. You just subtract the one from the other. Three minus three, three, two. Last one, that is the magnitude of the vector. So what is the vector P? The vector P is two, three. Alright, the vector P is two, three. So like I said, it's a vector where you go. 2 to the right, 3 up. Magnitude means how long is that line? What's the distance? And as you can see, right angle, triangle, Pythagoras. So it's simply the magnitude of P is the square root of 3 squared plus 2 squared. Okay. If you remember Pythagoras, 
the hypotenuse squared being a squared plus b squared meaning the hypotenuse is the square root of a squared plus b squared that's it that's why we do that okay so all you do is square root 3 squared plus 2 squared equals 3.61 it is so three significant figures okay i'm rounded also get you your marks question of what is this 5b 6b um just look at what it says here right uh, many students got the answer minus 213 which is wrong okay because with vectors direction is very important okay so let's look at this one carefully thoroughly and uh, see how to get the right answer which is not minus 213 which i originally thought was the answer as well so let's draw ourselves a little Cartesian plane that means the x and the y axis right and so the point B is 2 7 so roughly let's say that's 2 7 right so on the x that's 2 on the 7 that's the point B and that's the point 2 7 now that they say there's a vector starting at A going to be this is what why this is important the arrow going from a to b all right not from b to a because that's something else all right so this this column vector let's just remind ourselves what that means as well okay it means the top number tells us how many spaces to go left or right if it's negative we go left if it's positive we go right and the bottom number tells us how many spaces to go up and down if it's positive we go up and negative down now the point A is somewhere on this Cartesian plane and we end up going from A to B. And to get to B, we need to move four spaces to the left. Okay, to the left and six spaces up. That gives me an idea that A should be somewhere over here because we're going to have to move to the left, okay, to the left and up to get to B. The question is just, where is it? Okay, now if we move four spaces to the left, which means we go like this, four spaces, then we need to start over here at six. So the X value must be six. And then if we're moving uh, six spaces up, we need to start down below, six spaces down, that means it needs to be one. And that will give us this vector, A, B. And that's why the answer is six, one. Okay, if you, like me, thought the answer was minus two, 13, it's because what minus 213 is over there somewhere. You did the vector BA going from B to A if A was up there. Okay, so that was wrong. Okay, so we kind of have to work backwards. All right, we need to think the X value. What do I um, add? Where do I have to start off with? So if I subtract 4, I end up with 2. And for y, if I go up 6, where did I start with to end up with 7? Something like that. I hope that makes sense. 6, 1 being the right answer. Okay, be careful. Now we go vectors again, and this is a lot of people's favorite. Okay, and here's just a four mark question. And uh, very important here is to look at every fine detail and mark it out. Right, so in triangle OGH, M is the midpoint of OH. So that means that length and that length is the same. 
K divides GH in the ratio 5 to 2. So GH 5 to 2. So this is 5, this is 2. That means that whole line will be divided into 7 parts, of which this is 5 sevenths and this is 2 sevenths. OG is G. So in this direction, that is G. OH is H, so in that direction this is H. So it means this is a half H, and that's a half H. Nice. Find MK in terms of G and H. Give your answer in simplest form. So what we're looking for here is MK. that direction now the route I'm going to follow and you need to write this down because this this is a smart thing to do find a route you can follow right we need to find a route that we know so we can't just stroke MK so I'm gonna follow this route here which is the route MH and this route here which is MK that will give me no, it's not MK, it's HK. Goodness. That will give me MK in that direction. I mean, you can't go the other way, MO, OG, GK, it's a bit longer, so we take the shortest one. Problem is now here, we, we, have, we have this first part, MH, which is a half H, but we don't have HK, but we can work it out. Let's first find out what is the whole line here HG so we write that down HG would be HO going this long way from H to O and OG why did I take that route because I know HO is what in terms of H it's negative H because we're going in the opposite direction. We're not going OH, we're going HO. And OG we have, because they're giving us, that's G. Okay, to make it look nicer, we can swap it around it's G minus H. So we know this whole thing here is G minus H, which makes HK 2 sevenths G minus H. And of course, KG is. 5 sevenths g minus h but it's not relevant now okay so sweet that means that means that means that means that mk the one they want to know is mh which we know is half of h or h over 2 plus hk we just worked out which is 2 sevenths G minus H. And there we got it. That is MK in terms of H and G. Not in the simplest terms yet, but we're going to have it soon. Let's just expand those brackets. So 2 7th G and 2 7th times minus H is minus 2 7th H. So we just expanded the brackets there. Now we just need to collect like terms. A half h minus two seventh h. Just rope in the calculator there to save our time and brain power. So a half minus two seventh. Three fourteenths. So that will give us three fourteenth h plus two seventh g. And that should be the final answer because we can't add them together we just leave it at that let's have a look yep they got it the other way around which doesn't matter we got the 2 7th in front of the G the 3 40 in front of the H okay um, you get a mark for writing down the, a route so that's why this first part here, this is MH, HK, it helps a lot, right? So write that down, even just helps you organize your mind and it could get you a mark. So that is important. 
Question seven, functions. All right, first one, find g a half. So what we need to do is write down the function of g. And instead of x, we put a half. So what's two divided by a half? How many halves split into two? Answer, of course, being four. Okay, check it with your calculator if you're not sure. One mark. Then hg a half. Okay, there are different ways to do this. Different ways to do this. One way is we start, we write down h. Now h is 2 to the power of x. But instead of x, I'm going to write down g, which is 2 over x. And instead of x, I'm going to write down what they sub as a half. Now we already got g a half so all we actually have to do is take that answer put it into h which is 2 to the power of 4 2 to the power of 4 being 2 times 2 is 4 2 is 8 is 16 okay check it with your calculator but there it is okay or 2 to the power of whatever you wrote in the previous answer you get one mark so if you go whatever you wrote there you put it 2 to the power of that you get your mark follow through Find x when function of x equals 7. So we just need to take this function and equal it to 7 because that's what they wrote. They wrote fx equals 10 minus x, fx equals 7. That means 10 minus x equals 7. All right, this is the easiest I think is here is to subtract the 7 here and move the minus x to becomes a positive x. So it means x equals 3. Okay. Because 10 minus 3 is 7. Find x when gx equals h3. So what is gx again? 2 over x. So we got 2 over x, that's gx, equals function of h, which is 2 to the power of x. But they've changed the x for a 3 there, so let's do the same. Let's change this x for a 3. Okay. Now we're going to solve this one. Right, fine, so, what is 2 cubed? 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, not 6. Let's multiply the x on the other side, so that gives us 8 times x is 8x. Let's divide the 8, so x is 2 eighths. I'm sure you'll get your answer for that, but if you simplify it, you get 1 quarter. Okay, or equivalent, so yeah, you can write 2 eighths if you want, you can write a decimal value if you want. Okay, find the inverse of j, that's what they ask in d, okay, one way to do this, there's always more than one way, to find the inverse is you set the function of j equal to y, so 5 minus 2x equals y, and then we rearrange it. So first thing we'll do is subtract 5 from both sides, which leaves us with minus 2x. Then we divide the minus 2. This is not x minus 2, this is minus 2 times x. So we divide both sides by minus 2. So that gives us y minus 5 divided by minus 2 equals x. All right. Now, mathematicians don't like that minus all by itself under the line, so you divide everything by a negative, okay? <coughs> Which means you change all the signs, that becomes minus y plus 5 over 2. You know, like, that's a positive, a positive and a negative is a negative, and two negatives are positive, okay? And uh, swap them around if you want, just to make it look nicer so the final answer here is this over here but with an x put where the y is so that will be 5 minus x over 2 that's the inverse okay now it says or equivalent so the question is what if you wrote x minus 5 over minus 2 technically that's the same all right, and I believe you should get your marks when we check 
the examiner support they don't mention anything about that they just say don't forget to change that y for an x because you're gonna lose a mark so I believe that number two you should get full marks for that okay I believe it question e fx plus gx plus one simplify to single fraction in its simplest form so let's start let's write fx is 10 minus x gx is 2 over x plus 1 now write it as a fraction in its simplest form oh my word that's all I can say right one fraction one fraction in its simplest form so let's make them all fractions let's put it over 1 put it over 1 okay now they're all fractions before you add fractions, you need to get the denominator the same. Okay, now that means get them all as a fraction over x. So how are we going to do that? Well, you multiply the top and the bottom by the same number. In this case, it's x. So we need to multiply all of that by x. So it be x. Okay. Then there's a plus 2. It's already over x, so we don't have to do anything with that fraction. Keep it as it is. And here we do the same. Multiply the top and the bottom by the same number. 1 times x is x. Okay? If you want, you can imagine it being like this, right? So what we're doing is, uh, it's we multiply the top and the bottom there with x. We leave that one the way it is. And x over x, of course, is the same as 1. Okay, same thing. So now go everything, same denominator. Add the fractions. Let's expand the bracket. X times 10 is 10x. X times minus x is minus x squared plus 2 plus x over x. What can we do then? Well, we can add the two x's together okay so the two is going to stay the two 10x plus x is 11x minus x squared quadratic equation there is it going to help to factorize you think very hard to factorize that probably can't without using the quadratic formula Remember, you can't cancel the x's because there's a plus and a minus there. So I will bet that is the correct final answer. Let's have a look. 11x squared minus x squared plus 2. I've got 11 in front of the x. I've got a negative x squared and I got a plus 2. And that means I've got full marks. Okay, two marks for that first step if you got it like mine. And then for the top part, one mark for just writing down the functions next to each other, like I did in the first step. And you've done it, well done. Question F. I'm showing the examiner support here. It says this question and part require candidates to be rigorous. You know, rigorous means like yeah, aggressive, quite good with your use of brackets. Okay, so brackets is very important here. Well, let me show you why it's important and what most students make their mistakes with. We're using the function of x. Let's go and grab it from up here. The function of x, where is it? There's 10 minus x. So, the function of x is 10 minus x. So, that's what we're going to start off with. So, first here, we need to write the function of x, which is 10 minus x. And then we need to square it. Okay, of course we need to square everything, so you need to put everything in brackets. So far, so good, because most people got that right. Okay, then there's a minus. Okay. Then we got the function of the function of x. So we take the function of x, 10 minus x, and instead of 
the x, we need to put the function of x in there again. So we put 10 minus x. Okay, this is where brackets is very important. And I'm going to put these in bright orange. Okay, when we substitute the function of x into x, we substitute that x in there. We need to put brackets around. So we change the x for 10 minus x. Okay, that's the first part that's important. But also, this minus in front of everything, this is not just the 10, everything is negative. So you need to put hang in another pair of brackets there. Okay, because everything is negative. So when you substitute something in, put it in brackets. And when there's a minus, put everything that follows also in brackets. That's the rigorous use of brackets that they mentioned in the examiner's report and the people left out. Because that changes everything. Okay, so let's see what happens. First, we need to expand the brackets. So 10 minus x squared, of course, means 10 minus x times 10 minus x. Okay, so first thing you do is you do 10 times 10 is 100. 10 times minus x is minus 10x. Minus x times 10 is minus 10x. And minus x times minus x, two negatives makes it positive. And x times x is x squared. So that's the whole first bracket there, expanded. Of course, we can simplify minus 10x minus 10x to minus 20x plus x squared. First bracket expanded. Going over here to the other side with a multitude of rigorous brackets, let's just expand that first bracket there. So imagine there's a 1 there. So minus 1 times 10 is minus 10. And minus 1 times minus x is plus x. We have now got rid of the first inside bracket. Okay. Which, of course, let's write everything down again. 10 minus 10 is nothing. Zero. So we're left with a positive x or just an x. Which now with the minus in front is the same as minus x. Sweet. Now, what else can we do? Well, let's rearrange it because they said put the x squared first. So we put the x squared there. Minus 20x minus 1x is minus 21x and 100 at the end. So what's in front of the x squared? That is a, that is 1 because there's nothing. It's square 1. In front of the x, there's a minus 21. And at the back, hanging around, there's 100. 1 minus 21, 100. So actually, if once you get those bracket thing, correct? Right? Once you understand that, then you, it's not that hard. Just use the brackets rigorously. As I always say, you can never go wrong when you use brackets, but you can easily go wrong if you don't use brackets. For question G, I'm quickly again going to show you what the examiner's report said. Uh, it said, most candidates did not recall the most efficient way to solve H rank is to evaluate H tank. All right. Now, what lots of people online would tell you is to use logarithms. But as you can see, logarithms is not in the syllabus. So I'm not going to try and use that to explain this to you because you're not supposed to use it. They say the best way is to substitute 10 into the uh, function. So if h x is 2 to the power of x, put 10 in there, 2 to the power of 10. Okay. 2 to the power of 10, of course, being 1024. Okay. So that means the inverse of that to equal 10 would be 1024 because you're doing the opposite without using logarithms and that's what the mark scheme also shows you actually get a mark for substituting the 10 in there and this is the best way to find the inverse of exponential function like this one okay and I keep bringing it up in the exams because people keep getting it wrong and actually it's not that hard all right 
without using logarithms. Because teachers keep explaining using logarithms, which they shouldn't, because it's not in the syllabus. All they want you is to do what I've just done. Hope that helps, because it is quite a controversial question. Right, question eight. What do we see here? Well, I see triangles in a trapezium set in a 3D setup. Read all the information very carefully. The diagram tells you it's a horizontal ground, give you the lengths of each of the sides. They tell you these are vertical poles and there's wire straight and they show you the heights. Okay. And then it talks about angle ACB. Okay. Angle ACB is in a triangle. What is triangles? What do we do with triangles? We do trigonometry. Okay. And trigonometry is a few basic stuff. Okay. That you need to remember. If it's a right angle triangle, of course, you'll use Pythagoras. Or you'll use Sokatua. Angle ACB is an angle triangle ABC, and that's not a right angle triangle. Don't assume it is. Okay, in fact, they tell you that the angle ACB is 117.5, so it's not a right angle triangle. And if it's not a right angle triangle, every other triangle, what we're going to use is either the sin rule in its different forms. This is just one. Or, of course, the cos rule which starts off with a nice Pythagoras and then it evolves into a bit something a bit more chaotic. Right, so for question 8a, not a right angle triangles, we're gonna to have to use the sin rule or the cos rule that we know. All right, and what do we need to do? We need to find an angle, okay? Now the main thing to remember with the sin rule is opposites. If you got an angle and the opposite side and you want to find another angle or side and again you have the opposite of one you use the sin rule here we don't have any opposites okay no opposites i don't have any of the angles on the opposite side so we're going to we're going to use the cos rule okay and in fact okay if we wanted to work out a side because the lowercase letters are sides, we would have used the cos rule exactly the way it is there. But we want to work out an angle. So we can use this formula and rearrange it afterwards, or you can memorize the other version of the cos rule, which goes something like this. What is it again? All right. Uh, something like this. Remember, it's b squared plus c squared starts off the same. You move the a over the cross. It's a squared and then just remember this part is 2bc not negative anymore okay we can run through the whole arrangement how they got up to it you can memorize it or you can use the first formula it's all up to you but we're gonna use that second one because that's what we want to know we want to work out that angle so it's cos a equals b squared plus c squared minus a squared over 2bc thing though is we are not working out angle A, working out angle C. So the A's and the C's and the B's in our formula is not quite correct, actually. Okay. Because what they now have as uh, cos A should be our C. Okay, so what we actually need to do is we need to change it. Our A, in my formula now, the A. A is going to be the C, which means the lowercase a is there. And then which one is the B and the C? Well, that doesn't actually matter. You can put them in any order you want. So we make this the lowercase b and that the lowercase c, or you swap them around. What is important is that 20 is going to be the A and not the C, and the other two in any order. So that will give us actually cos C is the two adjacent sides to the angle 15 and 8 in any order so 15 square or 8 square plus 8 square or 15 square but the a has to be opposite the angle we want to work out which was 20 squared 
and down here we have two B and C again as 15 and 88 in any order. Okay, so to get finally the angle ACB, we need to move the cross over there. That's the inverse, of course. And again, 15 squared plus 8 squared minus 20 squared over 2, 15, 8. Okay, I like it all at once. Better for the calculator. It's less confusing. So you go shift. Inverse, of course, bracket 15 squared or 8 squared plus 8 squared or 15 squared minus 20 squared. That one's important. Over 2 and then again 15 and 8 in any order. Close bracket. And beautiful. That is exactly what they want. They said correct to one decimal place. So you need to show that the answer you got on the calculator is 117.54 etc rounded to one decimal place 117.5 and there we go all right they got the 15 as get well first but again you can swap them around uh, so they want to see that or if you use the other formula, like I said, you can. There it is. You can. And then two marks for the unrounded answer. That's important, yeah? That's important. Write the unrounded answer. And then round it. Okay. And this is if you don't do it on one step like I did. But that doesn't matter. All right. The area of triangle A, B, C. Okay, now you will know there's a formula for the area of a triangle. And this is the one everybody remembers. Always area of a triangle half base times perpendicular height. The one we forget is the trigonometric one. Half A, B, C. And C. Don't forget that one. That's the one we're going to use. Okay, area of a triangle of A, B, sin C. Now, of course, what is sin C? Sin C is the sin of an angle that we know, and in this case, we know angle C. So now the A, B, C is on the right place for us. And I gave it 117.5, so it's sent 117.5. That meaning A and B is correct now. So A would be actually this one. That would be A because it's not correct. Good about that one. And B is there. Okay. But again, if you swap them around, it doesn't matter because 8 times 15, 15 times 8, it doesn't matter. Okay. As long as you got an 8 and a 15 times a half so let's do that and bam 53.220 etc to three significant figures rounded 53.2 yep all the unrounded answer there's the formula or equivalent meaning you swap the 8 and the 15 around beautiful and they're not finished yet with that check calculate the length of aq all right so aq Go now, let's go, let's go, let's go. Green. A Q is that length, and hello and behold, it's inside a right angle triangle. Okay, and when we work with a right angle triangle and we're not using any of the angles, we use, of course, Pythagoras. So the Pythagoras rule here would be the hypotenuse, which is A Q. Squared equals the other two sides squared together so ac squared plus cq squared speed things up 
you're going to have to get rid of that square, so we're going to square root AC, of course, being 15 and CQ being 4. So it's 15 squared plus 4 squared. Let's go that up. Again, the order doesn't matter actually. 15.524. Round it to three significant figures, 15.5. There we go. The angle of elevation, meaning from the ground up, of Q from P, of Q from P. Okay. Let's get a ruler out. Angle of elevation. Where should we go now? Where should we go? Of Q from P. Angle elevation means you got a line that's horizontal with the ground going up. Okay, angle of elevation. This is maybe one that can be a bit confusing. All right, so it means this angle here, horizontal with the ground, going up. What is important is to understand what angle of elevation means, and that is an angle going up from the horizontal. Okay, so in this triangle now we have here, all right, we call this triangle Q, Q, P, well, we need to give that point a name. What do you want to call it? Tell me what do you want to call it. Call it X. Call it X. All right. So right angle triangle. The height of this pole is 3. So if we drew a horizontal line with the ground, this will be 3, and that will be 1. Okay, and this length here will be 8 because we've got a rectangle. So we've got a triangle there, 1 there, 8 there, right angle. This is, we call it Q, we call it X, we call that P, and we want to find out this angle here. Okay. Sweet, so what do we do if we want to find an angle in a right angle triangle? Yep, we use Sokatua. Okay, so let's get down here. Let's just do the work where we're supposed to do it. Okay, so remember we got the triangle. We got Q, P, 90 degrees, 1, 8. We want to find this angle here. Okay, going to use Sokatua. Okay, let's label the sides. Here we got the hypotenuse. The one is the opposite, and the eight is the adjacent. So what are we using? We're not using the hypotenuse, we're using the opposite and the adjacent, so it's gonna be tan. Now that angle, I'm gonna call it QPX. equals Tua, O is first, the opposite over the adjacent. So to find QPX, move the ton there, is the inverse of ton uh, 1 8. So here we go, shift ton 1 over 8, 7.125. Mm, small for an angle, isn't it? Okay, and angles we round to one decimal place. Is that what it says in the front of the paper? Yep, 7.1, but I'll give you marks if you round it to something less. 
All right, angle of elevation. That's important to remember. And now, question E. Another straight wire connects A to the midpoint of PQ. A to the midpoint of PQ. Now this gets insane. Let's clear the clutter. A wire connects from A to the midpoint of PQ. You can imagine this in three dimensions. Okay, calculate the angle between this wire and the horizontal ground. Okay, let's just make that wire straight. Okay, a wire going like this. The angle between that wire and the horizontal ground. So that means, first of all, we draw a horizontal line going down like this and then a horizontal line like that again we'll have now a right angle triangle which doesn't look quite right angle because that line isn't straight let's do this again so this will be a right angle triangle because that's with the ground what do we have in this triangle oh my word uh, we need to work out the angle over there you remember we had a right angle like that now this is one and that's halfway that means the height of this side will be 3.5 because it's halfway between three and halfway between four. We're going halfway up because half on that line. Sweet. What else do we have? On the ground here, there's a triangle. And this is eight, and we cut that in half, so this will be four, and that will be four. Okay, we got that 15 over there, and we got the angle C, 117.5. All I'm doing now is collecting as much information as I possibly can okay now in that right angle triangle what can I find out what can I do if we can get that base from A to let's call it was it A B C D P Q let's call this the point R just because it's Q P U R yeah if we can find A R and we got MR, we can use Sokatua to work out that angle. RAM, RAM. I'm sure there's just one way to do it. So let's use that base angle there. I'm going to call it triangle ACR. You see that? ACR. Let's draw it over here. Okay, so we got a triangle like this. Call it, call it triangle A C R. In that triangle, we got A C, which is 15, that given that to us. And in that triangle, we got C B, which is 8, but we've gone halfway now, so that's going to be 4, given that to us. And we got angle C, which is not there, but they told us down here to show it. So it is 117.5. I'm going to use that information to get this side here, AR. Okay, so what we have, we've got a right angle triangle. I want to know what's AR. Okay. Uh, what are we going to use? Well, we're not going to use Pythagoras or Sokatua because it's not a right angle triangle in this case. All right. We don't have opposites. So like if I had uh, the angle here or the angle there, then I use the sin rule. So we have to use the cos rule the way it is. So it's AR equals, okay, remember the cos rule is A squared 
plus b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. Okay, meaning a r squared. Now b and c again is those two sides adjacent to the angle in any order. Okay, so that will be again 15 squared plus 4 squared. Again, those two in any order. Cos and the angle. Okay, save us some time. We want to get rid of that square there, which means we want to square root everything over there. Sweet. So we're going to get AR by putting that into our calculator. Seventeen point two one six five. Okay, down rounded by a bunch of digits. So we got that AR is seventeen point two one six five. So what does that mean? What was it again? Seventeen point two one six five. Sweet. Now I've got a triangle here. ARM, which is a right angle triangle because it makes a 90 degree angle with the horizontal there. Okay. And we've got two sides. I can work out the third. So once again, let me draw that. Triangle AMR. Triangle A. M R and remember that's ninety degrees. We just work out this is seventeen point two one six five etc. And M R you know because uh it's halfway there, it's halfway there, so it's halfway between three and four, it's three and a half. That's what I said. So we want to the wide horizontal ground. The horizontal ground is AR. Okay. Right angle triangle. We want to find this angle here, which means we can now use Sokatua. Again, this is the opposite. This is the adjacent. So to find angle, we need to use tan. We want to use RAM on MAR. It's going to be the opposite over the adjacent. So the inverse of tan. Okay, look what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna remember that was on my screen, so I just put shift, turn bracket fraction 3.5. Oh, one bracket too many, I don't think it will matter. Answer it will insert the 72165 in all its glory in there. Let's just put the brackets and we got the answer 11.491. Yeah. Round it to three significant figures. Eleven point five. What is this? Meters? Anybody mention any units? Meters. Sounds like a reasonable answer. And that's what it is. Not from wrong working. Okay. 
So, is this the best way to do it? Yeah, it seems I did figure out the most straightforward way. They said you got 3.5, figure out. Use the cost rule. There's a different way to use it. Then use the ton rule. Okay, if you've got none of those, but you mark the correct handle on the diagram, special case one mark. Okay, and that's how you do it. Just go step by step, think carefully. Question 9a it says the total of the areas rectangle A and B is 20 centimeters squared. So, talking about the areas of the rectangle. So, let's do first the area of rectangle A. Of course, that will be length times width or width times length. So that will be x times 3x plus 4. Expand the bracket. So that's 3x squared plus 4x. That's the area of rectangle A. Rectangle B, that will be 2 times x minus 1. Length times width. So that gives us 2x minus 2. Yeah, 2 times x is 2x. 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. Then it says the total is 20, so meaning if we add it together, so you get 3x squared plus 4x plus the other one, 2x minus 2, you'll get 20. Add it together, 3x squared, 4x plus 2x is 6x. Minus 2 equals 20. Let's just bring the 20 over there, so 3x squared plus 6x minus 2 minus 20 equals 0 and then if you're not too much of a rush and you start writing ugly that will be minus 22 equals 0 okay so that's what they want to see I just did it separately expanded the brackets that will give us the marks Solve the equation, giving us correct four significant figures. So the moment you see that, you know, all right, this is a quadratic equation. I need to solve it. I can't factorize it because I'm going to have decimal answers. There's only one way to do this. And that is the quadratic formula. Okay, which means x equals uh, minus b plus minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Memorize that. In this equation, a equals 3, b equals 6, and c equals minus 22. So, let's substitute that in. So, minus 6 plus minus square root 6 squared minus 4, a was 3, c is negative 22. Extend that line over 2 times 3 3 okay remember we're going to get two answers one with a negative one with a positive i mean one putting a negative and one putting an ominous okay it won't always be a negative and positive answer so let's put that in minus 6 let's do the plus first plus square root 6 square Minus 4, bracket 3, bracket, bracket, negative 22, close bracket, down arrow, 2 times 3, I mean that's just 6. Bam. One answer. 1.86675. Did I say that right? 88675, etc. To get the other one, we need to change that plus for a minus. We just use the back arrow. We don't have to type everything in again. Remove the plus, put in a minus, equals minus 3.88675. Okay, now very specifically, four significant figures. We need to cut the first one there after the first four. There's a seven, so we need to round the six up to a seven. So it's 1.887. Same thing here, it will give us minus 3.887.
Are we correct? Yes, correct answer only. Surrounding here is important. All right, two marks for using the formula correctly. There it is. And then two marks for the two correct answers. Easy marks. Find the perimeter of rectangle B. Well, we now know what X could be. Could the perimeter be negative? I've never seen a rectangle with a negative perimeter. Maybe another dimension. So I assume we're going to use the positive answer here. Okay. So what we need to do is substitute that X into that X there. Meaning the width will be instead of x minus 1 it will be 1.887 minus 1 which will be 0 0.887 okay so that means the width here is 0 0.887 and that's 2 so the perimeter is twice 0 0.887 for the two opposite sides well we just do 0 0.877 plus 0 0.877 plus the two lengths which is 2 and 2 because remember perimeter goes around the outside okay so again 0 0.877 twice because See what I've done? See what I've done? See that? Oh man, you see that's why you need to get enough sleep the night before. You change an A to a seven, everything goes wrong, you lose silly marks. Plus two plus two plus two plus four, whichever way you want to type it in. And there we go. Five point seven four four. 5.774 Keep doing that Yep, they're happy with that, you round the three significant figures, they're happy with that as well Smart Right, question B again, it's like they ask you to Solve all the world's problems in two sentences The diagram shows two rectangles where H minus H is one Performing a quadratic equation and factorizing find the value of Y Amazing. I mean, the question is, how would you work out H? Okay. Let me make this clear. If you do H times Y minus 2, that will give you the area. Length times width, which will give you 15. So that means H equals 15 divided by Y minus 2. Agree? So how would you work out lowercase h? Same thing. H times Y will give you 20 because length times width, width of length in this case, will give you the area. So that means the lowercase h will be 20 divided by y okay now using that first line if we subtract the small h from the big h we should get one meaning if we do 15 over y minus 2 minus 20 over y we should get the answer one i don't know if this is the right thing to do i'm just doing what i can okay what they've given us now again algebraic fractions very important if we want to subtract them we need to get the denominator the same let me just quickly run through this again if you want to do a half minus a third we can get the denominators the same by multiplying the two and the three together that gives you six then you need to multiply the three over there and the two over there and you get the answer one sixth so we're going to do the same over here. We're going to multiply. I switch this color. Multiply 
the two denominators together that's y over y minus 2 multiply this y there that gives us 15 y and multiply that one there remember there's a minus in the middle so we need to multiply all of the y minus 2 with the 20 equals 1 right let's get rid of the fraction thing let's multiply all of this over there now 1 times anything stays the same so that gives us 15y minus 20y uh, are we going to expand these brackets now? no let's do it later now let's expand the brackets 15y hangs around minus 2 times minus 20 times y is minus 20y minus 20 times minus 2 two negatives makes it positive 20 times 2 is 40 y times y is y squared y times minus 2 is minus 2 I'm, I'm, I'm happy because quadratic equation means you need to have a square somewhere and there we just got it okay let's uh, rearrange a little bit here uh, 15y minus 20y is minus 5y And let's just scoot everything over to the right. That gives us y squared minus 2y plus 5y. I mean minus 5y plus y and plus 40 becomes minus 40. That's equal to 0. Okay. So that means y squared minus 2 plus 5 is of course uh, 3 minus 40 I'm just gonna put the equal to 0 there just because I like it. it doesn't matter which side it is okay I've got my quadratic equation smart now they say I have to factorize it so I can't use the quadratic formula we can if you want to cheat just find the two roots but factorize means we need to do this all right, think of two numbers and multiply together to get 40. Box to mind is 2 times 20. But whichever way we add them together, we will never get to a positive 3. Okay? So the other one to get 40 springs to mind is 8 times 5. Do notice a negative 40. So that means one of them has to be negative when we add it together we need to get plus 3y now of course minus 8 plus 5 gives me minus 3 so that's not gonna work but this one 8 plus minus 5 that's 3 that's going to work so there we go y plus 8 no, yes, y minus 5. Almost there. Now we can split it up. We can say y plus 8 equals 0. y minus 5 equals 0. Move the 8 across. So y is minus 8. And y is 5. Okay, what is the question? Find the value of y. Well, it can't be minus 8, so it must be 5. Is this right? Well, imagine you're, the, you're in the exam and it feels really good, yeah, but if y is 5, that means h must be 4, because 5 times 4 is 20. If y is 5, then the length of this side is 3, so h must, big h must be 5, because 5 is 15, and 5 minus 4 is 1, and that's what they said there. I feel pretty confident we got the right answer. So, let's see what the mark scheme says. Five it is. Okay. Lots of marks for finding this quadratic equation. Okay. So, they're starting by recognizing how to 
rearrange it seeing that you're gonna have to subtract them tough question I agree so reading the examiner's report um, says yeah it was a difficult question not many students got it right um, some students try a trial and error but then it gets you one mark if you do trial and error um, try your best yeah if you struggle everybody struggle but you can do it you can do it question 10 is a bit different from stuff we've done before don't let that scare you right just stay confident say yeah i can do anything the diagram shows a sketch of the graph y equals the function of x between minus 1.5 you see there and 6 you see there so that really tells us this is the point 6 there we go down there this is the point minus 1.5 so x is from there to there the coordinates of five points in the graph are shown so the a b c d and e we can see them all right the function of x equals k has two solutions in the interval okay so what have they changed here from y fx to fx equals k what's changed the function of x equal to y the function of x equal to k that means k equals y this is another change the y for k that means we're gonna find our answer on the y-axis okay somewhere over here okay two solutions means what does that mean that's a, what does two solutions mean let's get our ruler out okay it means we will cross the graph twice for example over here that is zero solutions we don't cross the graph okay over here if I touch that point I will have one solution okay over here we'll have two solutions see two solutions two solutions okay from here onwards one solution so that won't work one solution uh, and then all of a sudden well this is one point here we'll have two solutions but above that that will have three solutions if I have this line here you see we cross the graph three times that will be three solutions and then again above there that's two solutions until we get one and above higher zero solutions so all those lines I've drawn you will have two solutions because each line crosses the graph in two places okay between those places of course the graph continues or the line across it more times but just within this graph okay write down a possible integer value okay oh, so we just need one of them possible integer value of k as one of them so we don't have to make it too complicated so let's take this line over here for example okay looking at the y values between 3 and 5.5 so anything between 3 and 5.5 four five um, integer means whole numbers of course whole numbers so i'm gonna say my answer is four not three four okay five would also be correct looking you know like this line that could be y equals five looking at this line here only one y equals seven and then that line over up there this one here i guess that will be eight or nine okay so that's it four five seven eight or nine i think that's the possible answer four or five seven eight or nine yep so anywhere where the line might cross it in two places Okay, two places, exactly. Smart. So four is right, but also five. Seven, eight, or nine. Only one of those. Any one of those. You don't have them all. Only one. Okay, function x equals j. So now they've changed the y for a j. That means y equals j. So again, we're going to find our answer on the y-axis. 
for the same integral has no solutions when j is less than a and j is more than b find the maximum value of a and the minimum value of b so let's again go back there so no solutions mean where it doesn't cross at all so you can see there's a line there it doesn't cross the graph that means there's no solutions okay um, it doesn't say integer okay it doesn't say integer so these are not whole number answers but it say where j is less than a remember that we're looking for y values so the highest this line can go up is just below that point which on the y-axis is 3 so it means it could be 2.999 2.9 recurring okay but because we got the less than sign there it means we don't include that a value anything less than it so it's going to be 3 anything 3 on the y-axis not 3 included so meaning 2.9 recurring yeah if they put a little line underneath there we would have written 2.9 recurring because it includes that value but it doesn't anything less than 3 but not 3 included okay and then this one here of course that's a maximum value because it's the highest we can go we can go up to just below 3 and then bigger than b where there's no solution so as we saw before we'll have one and then two and then one and then three and then everything up to here that line again no solutions all right and what is the y value there 10 so anything above 10 so 10 point zero 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 infinite one you know anything about but not 10 included so that would be 3 and 10 so there we go okay find the coordinates of the two stationary points on the graph y equals x to the power of 6 minus 6 x to the power of 5 you must show you're working this is plain straightforward a differentiation question okay stationary point the gradient okay like for this is not the same graph obviously but stationary point is where the graph turns where the gradient is zero okay to find where the gradient is zero we need to differentiate okay so dy over dx differentiation you do 6 times 1 in front of the x, 6 times 1 is 6, subtract 1 from that 6, so the 6 to the power of 5, 5 times minus 6 is minus 30, subtract 1 from that 5, x to the power of 4, and at the stationary point the gradient is 0, so we set that equal to 0. Right, what now? Well, we need to get rid of some of those x's, and for that we can factorize. Okay, so what do they have in common? They got a common factor of 6 and a common factor of x to the power of 4. If we take that out, we're left here with an x. 6 times 5 is 30. All right, did you get that? Did you get it? Okay. Okay. Don't get it. Let's do it again. All right. So, six x to the power of five is six times x times x times x times x times x. That's six x to the power of five. Thirty is five times six. To the power of four is x times x times x times x. Common factor there is six. We got that six from, and four x's from both. That's we get x to the power of 4. What is left here then is an x. And there's a minus 5. Okay, factorized. Now we can... Oh, my neighbor's building. 
Okay, split up. So 6x to the power of 4 equals to 0. x minus 5 equal to 0. Divide 0 divided by 6 is 0. Root 4 of 0 is 0. So x is 0. And x equals 5. Right, so we got two x values. We got x is 0. Not x is x. x is 0. And x is 5. Now we define the y values, all right? And to do that, we simply substitute these x values back into a original equation because that's where the y is, isn't it? So first one, y equals x to the power of 6 minus 5, x to the power of 5, but x is 0. So 0 to the power of 6 is 0. 0 to the power of 5 is 0, 5 times 0 is 0, 0 minus 0 is 0, so that gives us y equals 0, if x is 0, y is 0. And the other one, y equals 5 to the power of 6 minus 5. Okay, and as you see, I'm falling asleep. That's a mistake there. That should be a 6, so if we put that... 5, make it a 6, bam, minus, three one two five minus three one two five. So what I've done is I went to decimals, I graphed it, so that's y equals x to the power of 6, and that so yeah, 5 there should also be a 6. There it is. As you can see, there through 0, 0, that is one turning point. And the other turning point, as if we zoom out immensely, because we need to go all the way down to minus 300, 3,000, 125 we'll get the other turning point there we go there it is crazy graph okay that means we got the right answer zero zero minus three one zero okay one mark for the the der the derivative setting equal to zero two marks for differentiating differentiating correctly one mark for setting equal to zero and then for solving it and then you got your marks. Well done. Keep working hard. You can do it. In no time, you'll be the champ.